morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, it's good to see the sun after a few days of, of cloudy weather that we've been having. It's uh, a little bit easier to get up and get at it, at least for me. This morning we're going to be taking a look at the title of the message is, I am coming home. We're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24 today, and I'd like to read that for us here right now. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I, would, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his, his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him out into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have good food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no, I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to, to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is, he is found. So the party began. I always loved that story, and if you read that portion, if you go, uh, if you go at the beginning of Luke, it'll tell you about a lost coin, and, and you know, and, and it finalized here with a lost individual, one that was lost and needed to be found. This, uh, what the father did here, uh, is kind of foreign to us probably. Uh, how many kids would come to their dad and say, Dad, I want my portion of your estate right now. And, and the, the part that really uh, shocks me is that the father agreed to all this. But we're, this story, if you, if you see it and, and already know, is not really talking about a man on earth and a son on earth. We're talking about the, our Heavenly Father in heaven and, and us as his children trying to make our way in this life. We're going to take a look here uh, at the life of a prodigal. To a child, to a youth or a young man, this sounds awesome. I can remember my younger days. It's a little hard, but it's I can still grasp it, grasp it for a while yet. Uh, but I remember that I didn't really like adults, and particularly my parents, telling me what to do. I, th I just thought, and I didn't rebel, and I didn't go ballistic on them or anything like that, but I thought, wouldn't it be nice to be out of school and be my own boss? All of this idea sounds good on paper until it starts to play out, and we get out of our house and we get into our own lives and realize that we're still not out from under somebody telling us what to do. We are not going to escape 
it, I just, it amazes me that, that children uh, growing up and getting into the teen years and so forth seem to think that when they become 18, they'll never have to listen to anybody tell them what to do again. <laughs> and I, as gently as possible, and sometimes not so gently, remind them that they're going to probably have to have a job to, to work and to make money so that they can put groceries on the table, buy clothes for their kids, and so forth. Well, they look at me like I'm from another planet, you know, like, no, no problem. I can just come home and get money from you. You know, that must be what they're thinking because that's how it's been up until now. But it sounds good. All this sounds awesome until they get out into the highways and the byways of life. And they have to start feeding the pigs. And what the pigs are eating looks pretty good to them because they're hungry. Well, this prodigal took all that he had, and I don't think he took a you all. I think he put it on his shoulder and took it. He didn't have a whole lot when he left home. Everything that he owned, he could put in a, on his back and on his shoulder and take off. So he had his inheritance, and as any young person probably would do, didn't try to budget it out and figure out how to make this stretch and get into something. You know, they're not thinking that way, or they wouldn't have left in the first place. <clears throat> this kind of living is all fantasy. I don't know about you, but I have fantasized about certain things in my life. It's not real, though. Most of the things that I fantasized about in a perfect world, like heaven, it might work. But not here, because there's always people that want stuff and, you know, you can't, you can't do what, but we can fantasize in our minds, life could be awesome. And that's what it is to this, this prodigal. In his mind, he could see himself out here on his own, just enjoying life and laying on a beach under an umbrella someplace, you know, for life. Soaking up the sun when he wanted, get under a shade tree or a palm tree whenever he wanted to or needed to. It's all fantasy, illusion, not real. And it didn't take too long into this story that the prodigal found himself wishing he was home once again. When everything hits, crashes in, the life becomes real, the honeymoon's over. They're not going to be able to continue the way they thought they were going to be able to continue. And all their fantasy and all their illusion and, and dream uh, come crashing down around them. What he thought was bad, he now sees as pretty good. And that's, that's life. That's what happens to us in this life that we live. And I hope that you're not looking at this. I'm not, this message today is not a message where I'm, I could change, change gears and, and go to an to a evangelistic, uh, try to get people saved kind of a message. And if there's somebody here today that needs the Lord, uh, that, that could be what, see, I'm not the one that, that takes this message and puts it out into the hearing of each of you. We all have ears to hear, and, and we hear what God wants us to. He can take something that I am saying directly toward a certain situation, and somebody else can tell me later, you, you spoke directly to me in this regard, and that, wasn't even, that was the furthest thing from my, from my mind. You see, I'm not the one. I'm just saying what God wants me to say. He takes what I say, and he puts it into your hearts and lives in a way that you might hear a totally different thought than what I was even alluding to, and uh, I'm always kind of amazed of how God can do that to us. I remember when I was a youth and when I gave my life to the Lord, the guy that spoke that day, he wasn't speaking a message that was salvation. But the whole way through that, I heard something different. It was like a different message <laughs> completely. Then God 
had me come to, the, to an altar. But that's not where we're at today. I want us to realize today that all of us have a little bit of prodigal in all of us. That we all sometimes want to go our own way. We all want to do what we want to do. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure that we have people in here today that, that wished and, and have dreamed and have illusion and fantasy as to how this Christian walk should go. So take this not as a me telling you that you are lost in sin today and you need to come to an altar. No, you just need to come to the Lord today to have him help you in this life that, that sometimes doesn't go the way that we would like it to be. I want us to look at the, some stages uh, of rebellion that we might be able to relate to some of these uh, as we go through them today. Rebellion or sin, it, whatever, missing the mark, the stages that we go through, and I, I took these from the story as to what was happening here with the prodigal. And so the first thing that I want us to take a look at is departure. Departure doesn't start with me walking. If it did, uh, we could head that off. We could shut the door. The prodigal, before he departed, it started, departure starts in the mind. Departure is not something that we just all of a sudden wake up one day and say, I'm going to leave. Now, it could, but that's not usually how it works. Usually there's months and years of, of being discouraged about the way life is. And, and I want us to know here today that usually what we're discouraged about and upset about is just life. It's not, we want to have a life of cushiness, a life that we want to be directing ourselves, not somebody telling us what to do, but that's not real, that's just fantasy. Departure starts in our hearts, in our minds, which is basically the same thing. It's the center of us. If you look at the word and, and search it out, when they're talking about the heart, they're talking about the center of somebody's life, which is usually has to do with the mind and the thinking. So this starts with the mind. We become to focus on us on selfishness. And when we do that, sin is just a little ways behind following. When we become selfish, sin is the next thing that's lurking behind us in the bush. The prodigal here in this story, he acted on what he'd been thinking about, what he'd been fantasizing about for, for years. And I, I guess if you looked at the, uh, the story from a historical thing, you could see that uh, maybe the father divided up his property. I know the firstborn son would, would get the majority of, of the, his takeover, his inheritance, and then the other one would get an inheritance. But mostly in the stories that I've read, even in the Bible, they wait till the father dies or is incapable of, of taking care of himself and then there's the division of property. I would not want today to build a house and do all the things that I needed to do and not have an abundance of surplus left over and have to divide my house and my property up to my kids. That would be okay if they took care of you, but I really uh, wouldn't like them to take care of me. They might try to tell me what to do, and I don't think I would take that real good just like they don't like to tell us to tell them what to do. So I think the tables would be turned uh, a little bit. So in this story, though, this is how it went, and Jesus told him that uh, the father divided up his inheritance and gave it to them. And the youngest son took his and went out and began to have a party uh, that he thought was going to be life, you know, continual party. The first thing was departure here. The next thing, the next stage of this progress of us being rebellious is bankruptcy. Now, financially, I wouldn't have to go very far to be bankrupt. However, we're not talking necessarily about money here in bankruptcy. 
we can be bankrupt and still have a lot of money. We can be bankrupt in our lives. We can be bankrupt in our hope and in our thinking of going forward. We can be disgusted with, with what we've done and we can get to a place of, of physical bankruptcy. Financially, this prodigal was there in every step of the way. He was, in every respect of bankruptcy, he was there. He didn't have a lot to work with, I don't think. I think he, he only had uh, enough to, to just get him into trouble. And then he would be in real trouble down the road. So bankruptcy. Uh, the ones that seem to be rebellious, when you talk to them about reality and life and truth, they don't want to listen. They think they know better. And to tell them that you need to save, save your money and, and spread it out and use it in a way, most of them don't want to listen to that. We, I, that's my experience with, with my kids. And, and uh, they just think that, OK, well, they're, they're courteous enough to maybe not argue with me face to face. But they're thinking in their head, well, I hope he gets done with this story quick, because I don't believe it. And so they go out and waste their money. I had three sons in my, in my uh, first marriage, and uh, they're all different. One of them didn't care about anything. He didn't plan, he didn't save, he didn't do, he just thought life was just gonna, it was just, you didn't have to practice or play, prepare or nothing, it was just gonna happen. He was the middle one. The oldest one, uh, <laughs> he was. He knew how to play the game with me. He could make me think that his guy's got it all, and he knows everything, and and uh, and he would never back talk, and he would just right there. But I hear stories later that when he took my car out, he would be racing his his cousin or somebody, and they would the the, the card blew up, and and he didn't say, "Oh, that was probably my fault." He, he had it on the verge of growing up, and I took it, and it blew up. It went with me driving, but he's the one that did it. So he was a little bit on the sneaky side in, in life. He would do all the things that I told him not to do, but it, he always, oh, that wasn't me, and, you know, and he was always able to pull that over until later, because the truth does surface eventually. And the younger one, uh, he, he didn't, he always got caught uh, in what he was trying to do, which is, in life, this is probably not a bad thing, to, to get caught and to know that I have to uh, fess up here and do the thing. So that's what we had. The prodigal is somewhere in here, in this thing, uh, in this story. In the bankruptcy, reality is going to sink in eventually. The truth is going to be overtake the fantasy and, and, and what was looking good in the departure part. Pleasures, in this thing here, we have that, the saying, you know, the pleasures of sin for a season. The scripture actually tells us that sin is pleasurable for a while. And then we are unsatisfied again going down the road. But while we're in the middle of sin, that's why we, we go that way. It, it feels good for a while. It's, it satisfies for a little while. That's where this prodigal was at. He didn't care about the future. He wanted to spend everything that he had, waste it on right now. Because right now is what he, that's right now is where the prodigal was living. Any of us that, that uh, fall into this category of, of prodigals or a slightly rebellious in nature, it's usually because we're in the right now. We want things to come together now. We don't want to wait till five years from now or build up to something. We want to do, have it and have it right now. The, set, the, the next thing that I want us to take a look at is in this rebellious streak or in this direction that we're headed, bondage uh, is probably shortly behind uh, the bankruptcy. Now we don't have, we're away from home, we're on our own, more or less, far enough away that we can't get help from dad. 
or any other relatives, and we're on our own. When our money runs out, we're, we quickly find out that we need money to buy food. That truth that Dad was telling us, he, that rascal was right. He wasn't just telling me something to make me mad. We need to have money. And we use it wisely so that we can eat tomorrow, too. And so that's kind of where we're headed here. Bondage sets in after that. When everything runs out, now we're in, we're in the bondage to this situation. We're in bondage to, to sin. We're in, in bondage to our, our, our false ideas of what was real and what's, what's fantasy. Or what's, what's fantasy. They thought they were slaves at home. That's why he wanted to get out of there. He was in bondage to his dad and his family and his, and his the farm and in the small town or in wherever they felt they were trapped. And he, and now, when he's on his own, he realizes that now he is in real bondage. This is real. This is not what I thought. You see, and how. This is all happening quite a bit right in the, our minds. Our mindset is, is, is probably one of our own worst enemies. And the one scripture tells us to take our thoughts captive. That's what needed to happen before they departed. If we do, and, and we do not rebel against God, he's going to help us to come to the reality of how things need to be. When we're young and we're rebellious, we don't see what God has for us as being something that's going to be more beneficial than what I can develop for me. We seem to think that I know what I like and what would make me pleasing, be pleasing to me better than God. Only to find ourselves feeding pigs in total bankruptcy of life before we realize that maybe God did have a better plan for me. Maybe the, what he wanted me to do would be more rewarding in the long run and even up front. Bankruptcy from that point in our life we can look forward and we can say it really wasn't that bad at home. Dad wasn't that bad of a guy. My brother really wasn't as trouble as, as irritating as I once thought. So life is starting to look better. We're starting to see a crack in, in our thinking, in our picture that we have painted in our minds. There's we can there's a a little bit of a parting of that, and we can begin to look beyond into our past and think, I wish, I wish I could be back there again for, for the food. You know, that would be awesome to have food enough. But we start to look back, no matter if it's not for food. In our rebelliousness, once we get into that place where things aren't going the way we hoped they would go in our lives, we start to see what possibilities there would have been when we were living at home. What was going on there really wasn't that bad. And we begin to start to, to see. But we're still not there. We haven't left, we haven't decided to make that transition once again. There's still more that has to happen before we'll make that transition. I, I see here the next step as being hopelessness. They see every, every direction that they look, every place they look, every place they go in this prodigal's life now is hopeless. There's no positive way. He, he looks out at life and he says, I can't see this ending good anyway, any direction I go. There is no way that I can do it. He's still not to the place where he wants to swallow his pride and, and, and call dad and say, I need help. There's no place in our lives right now, if we're in rebellion, where we want to 
swallow our pride and, and say to God in our, on our knees, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need your help. You're the only way that I can get out of this mess. They're still in that worldly direction yet. We're, we haven't given in to God and we become hopeless. We can't see a way out. We haven't said in our heart yet, I have sinned against you. Our days are spent physically carrying out what somebody's telling us what to do as slaves and regretting every moment of the day. We're starting, we're getting close. If you're starting to see here in this story, we're starting to get close to find coming to our, our senses. And when it says coming to our senses, it's really coming to the, to the Lord. It's really uh, recognizing the mess that we've got ourselves into. And we recognize that it wasn't somebody else that's doing it. Today, of all times that I've seen, there is an awful lot of blaming people. Nobody wants to take the responsibility for, for anything. It wasn't the dad's fault in this story. It wasn't the older brother's fault in this story. It was the prodigal's own decision to do it. There isn't like, well, you made me do it. You, you made life, you know, and I've talked to people, my own kids, I've talked to them and they, I'd get them, I'd lead him right to where I know the next words would say, well, it, it had to be my fault. I could never get those words, it was my fault, out of them. They could throw a baseball through a window and I said, why'd you do that? Well, it wasn't my fault. My brother missed it. He should have caught it. And I say, well, okay, let's go in a different direction. Why were you playing baseball at the house? Why were you standing right in front of the window throwing the ball toward the house and hoping that your brother doesn't miss? You know, and, and well, it was it's, somehow there they would turn it around. It wasn't their fault. I have not yet found anybody in my family that wants to say, well, short of my wife and I, we'll admit when we're wrong to each other. Thus, we're able to be into marriage at 22 or 3, 20, 24. <laughs> I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, 24 years into it. It took me a, a marriage before to figure that out, that we need to be honest and, and upfront and tell her that we goofed and tilt to that. So but the Lord needs that. If we want to spend time as his children, we have, to, we have to admit when we've made a mistake. We have to admit when we've sinned. If we don't, there's no help. Where can we go if we don't think we're wrong? That's where this is at, hopeless. They, they don't want to give in to the fact that I've made a bad choice here. I have sinned greatly, and it's my fault. They're right on the verge. They're right there. This guy is just about ready to say, I know what I can do. If they come to the end of themselves, and there they are. The grass wasn't greener on the other side. They find out that the other side was no better. There's problems there, too. Whenever anybody's I'm counseling somebody and they talk about how this life turned out and it's a mess, I don't give them a whole lot of hope that the next one, if they would do, is going to be a whole lot better. There's going to be maybe not those same problems, but there's going to be problems that are just as devastating to them. And they need to, to, to just go into life knowing that life is not going to unfold for you. And if it doesn't, that you don't leave this mess and go to another one. All marriages, all of our life situations, occupations, in every part of our life, there's problems. There is things that just have to be worked on to make them right. There, there is times in our life when we just have to bite the bullet and say, I can't do this, God, on my own. I'm, I, I need your help. I don't like this guy that I work with. He's a nasty rascal. And God would say, you need to love him. You need to do this and just keep going and, and get through it. It is those things in life that make us strong as Christians. 
If life just unfolded for us, we would be a whole bunch of wusses, and we wouldn't be able to handle anything, and God wouldn't know if we loved, he loved, we, we love him for any other reason than he's just been blessing us. And as last week's message, he would, have, he would be wondering in his head, when things get a little bit out of your way here, out of your life that you don't like, are you going to leave? Are you going to go somewhere else? Are you going to pick a different life or pick a different job or pick a different wife or husband? No. Work on what we have. Get it right. Because there's always problems that are going to surface that are going to be just as devastating down the road. The prodigal found out, and he, after he went through all of it, he realized, he came to his senses, and he realized what he had. Sometimes we can't go back. Sometimes we burn bridges, and we, we are there. That doesn't mean we're done. And the prodigal here, could have, God could have worked with him, and he could have done something different if there wasn't a possibility of coming back home and making things right. I want us to hear today that when things are not good and we have made poor decisions and we have sinned, we can always come back to the, to the God. He is a father that not only will he see us coming, he won't wait for us to get to him. He's going to come to us on the way. That's the beauty of this story. The beauty of how God loves us. Even when we're in the midst of sin, he loves us but we still have to come to him. We have to come. He'll meet us. And when he sees us coming, he'll run to us and embrace us and let us know that he loves us as, as sons and, and daughters. The next step in this rebelliousness is death. Uh, death to our selfishness in this story. Death to my fantasies. And, and hopes and all that I thought it was going to be death has to come in there and we die to self we die to my way and take God's way death has to take over in this situation if we want to find out what life is all about and we start to realize when we're at the bottom of the barrel we are on our backs and the only place to look is up that's what took place here that's that's death I don't want to make this lightly I want us to understand that when I'm saying that we're we made bad choices in life we're not good with that. God's not good with that because that's sin. When we make a mistake in, in life and choose the wrong way, that's sin. If we don't correct that, we're not going to make it to heaven. So it sounds better for us to say I made a mistake than that I've sinned. You see what the prodigal did here? He says, I know what to do. I can go to my father. When I get to him, I will tell him that I have sinned against God and I've sinned against you. He's not going to get in front of God and say, I made a little mistake. You'll understand it and don't over, you know, let it go. No, he went to the God and he was honest with him and he said, I blew it. I sinned. In my heart, I did the things that I shouldn't have done. He took responsibility for what he did. Death brings us to that spot. Death of our, our way. When we get to that, down on our back, death to my way, then we accept the responsibility, we call it what it is, and God will forgive us. He's up there wanting to forgive us of all of our sin. And unless we say to him, I have sinned, he can't help us with our sin. We sometimes get to the place where we just think, that's too harsh. It's too harsh for me to call what I've done sin. But if it's, if it's rebelliousness, then we, it's sin. If we're not doing what God wants us to do, it's sin. No matter how you slice it, how you look at it, how you, whatever microscope you put it under, it's going to finally look like sin. We 
when we get to that place, we're at the rock bottom, which is not a very bad place to be when we're ready to find and go back to the Lord. If there's a hope that I can turn this thing around, we're not going to come to God. If I think I can fix it in some way, maybe make one more choice and go this direction and tweak it a little bit over here, that I can make it, we're never going to go to the Lord. We have to be absolutely at the end of our rope. We have to be obviously where I can't do one more thing. And, and, and when we're doing that, we recognize that every choice that I made put me deeper into this mess. Every time that I've sinned, I'm, I'm further away from the Lord. Every time that I've sinned, I make my life less likely to pan out. And the only way that our life is going to make sense and become anything at all good for us is if we make it to heaven. Nothing in this life is worth our soul. Nothing that we do that's away from the Lord, done on my own, without the help of the Lord, is going to be of any value unless I recognize that I was straying away from, from God and admit that I can't do this. That's a hard thing for some of us to do, is to admit that I'm wrong, that I have sinned. When we do that, we do that because we're rock bottom. We're down to the last thing. You'd have hoped that this prodigal would have got it when he was bankrupt and realized what he needed to do. And I would say there was a little voice in him that was saying, You're, you gotta go home. But the guy says, I got this. I can keep going, we'll get, we'll get through this. No problem. But the next place was even worse. And the next place was worse. It finally got him on his back. His ears now are finally open to truth open to the way reality really is. Have you ever been there and come to the reality that I can't do life without God? Even when things are going pretty good in my life, it would have been better if I would have stayed closer to the Lord. Maybe I, maybe I have been caught up in life and I'm busy and I haven't, done, I haven't read the word or I haven't prayed for, for weeks and we start to feel kind of skinny hungry for the word we can do it by staying fresh by reading the word there, there, when things are going good for us the best way to keep it going good is to continue to be close to the Lord so that we can be of some value to the Lord he wants us as his witnesses to be shining examples of Jesus we can't do that if we don't spend time with him we have to read the word, we have to pray, we have to talk to him so that he can hear from, uh, from us and we can hear from him. He wants to do, the, he can see our lives in, in, a, in a perfect perspective. He can see us being his examples that are touching lives and making people choose and want to be Christians, Just, but, but we, we're not doing what he wants us to do. And we're not close enough to him to hear from him, to say, go over here, do this, be that. We want to do it our way. We want to go to heaven, but we don't want to listen to God. The prodigal wanted all the benefits of being a son, but he didn't want to do it the dad's way. So he chose his way, which ended in the pig pen of life. That's what happens to us. We choose, even if somebody appears to have had a pretty nice life and they got enough money to be retired on and, and life is good it might not be as good as they look if you would be able to hear the voice inside of them talking and have regrets about certain things even the best of our lives could be better if we did them with the Lord there's more to this life Jesus told us that he wanted to give us an abundant life that's not waiting for heaven. That starts when we get saved and, and is culminates and is really fulfilled in heaven. But we get there's benefit of being a Christian right now, not only for us, but for his kingdom. 
He wants us to be to bring glory to him. We can't do that as a prodigal. We have to come to him. We have to be the, the son that stayed home, that, that is enjoying and doing the things that need to be done so that the farm can, can be all that it can be. In the conclusion here today, we think we know everything, and God doesn't know anything. As a father, I felt that from my kids from time to time. After I, I haven't changed anything, don't, but after they get to a certain age, and that can be varied from family to family and kid to kid, the parents become geniuses once again. They realize that what mom and dad were telling them really was right. They wished that they would have listened. It would have saved an awful lot of experience that was bad, but we don't. So often don't. We question everything, and that's the nature of the age. We question everything that mom and dad or our Sunday school teachers or the pastor or, or uncles and grandmas and grandpas tell us. We question everything they say. It's, but they don't question what their, their friends say. They take everything they say word for word and verbatim, but mom and dad are, they got an evil plan against me for some reason, and they're telling me this as a lie to catch me. They, they, they question all the things that they've ever been taught. I like the scripture that tells us in Proverbs that whatever we're taught, we won't depart from when we get older. That's why we become geniuses at a later day here, because they see the truth later. What they were taught, they pushed it aside, climbed over it, and did their thing, and then that thought stays with them in their head. The, the climbing over it is in here. It stays with them, and so when they start feeding pigs and the pods, the pods look better, look good to them, it's because the truth is starting to that they left and climbed over, it's now starting to get to them. What they were taught is now becoming more, looking better and better all the time. That's why your son or daughter will come to you and ask for advice, maybe when they're 20 or 24, and listen to it finally and say, wow, that's amazing. I see that happening and working. Not when they're 15. You're they're not very bright. They think they know everything. Are we ready to come home? To come back to that God that never left us? The God that's always there, waiting for us to see the light? To come to our senses and realize what he had instead of what we're after? The Father never left. He'll be there. He's ready to open his arms, run to you, and meet you wherever you're at. What an awesome thing. He can do that in us. For those of us who have been saved, we're living for the Lord, but we have other plans for our retirement, other plans for our life, what we would like to do, and we're starting to have just enough money maybe that we can do some of those things. Follow the Lord, especially during that time. What he has for you is just as exciting and just as good as it was when you were 30 or 20. He's got some good things planned for you. He doesn't, what I accomplish physically, financially, that looks great to me, really isn't that important to God. He'll help us with it if, it's, if, if we're headed in the right direction. But the goal is we need to help somebody else find their way to heaven. And we need to be the right Christian to be able to do that. And to do that, we've got to get rid of all the selfishness and rebelliousness that's, that's in us. So today, as we have the, uh, a scripture or a song that we're going to sing, Shirley's going to lead us, uh, as we sing this song today, kind of examine ourselves today, if you haven't already, 
and see if there's maybe a little bit of this prodigal, that rebelliousness still within us today that says, I just want to do this. I really don't, I'm tired. I would like to just sit in my easy chair. And God said, no, not yet. Get up off the chair and I want you to still do some things for me. He doesn't have us do stuff just for, it's not like gym class where we just, he just makes us go through a bunch of spiritual, athletic things to make us stronger. He wants us to do something for him specifically. So he has legitimate things, acts that he wants us to still do. And they might not be that strenuous physically, but they may be very strenuous spiritually and very valuable. So uh, where are you at today? If we're singing this song and, and God has been nudging you a little bit, uh, you can pray right where you're at or you can come to the altar and pray. It doesn't matter. You just need to go to the Lord and tell him, I'm coming home, God. I've been wrong. I've been sinful uh, in my thinking. Um, I just need to get headed in the right direction. Let me finish out my life in a productive way, staying close to you and doing the things that, that you want me to do. And lo and behold, you're going to see relatives and friends saved because of it. That's where we're at. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you right now thanking you for this awesome story that you, the parable, the story that you put into the, to the Word that we can read today and re re recognize that the prodigal uh, life is we all have a little streak of us in us. We've all been wrong and sinned and have turned the different direction that we should have went. Today, I would ask that you would help us to give all of our rebelliousness, rebelliousness to you, to take away the sin that we have committed and forgive us and help us to go forward with a whole new life and attitude that's, that's bringing glory to you. We love you, we thank you, and ask your blessings on our, our day and the days ahead here as we try to focus on you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.